Today we will be talking about the pain thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. This is also one of the very important topic. And uh, pulmonary embolism and deep pain thrombosis, both is also known as venous thromboembolism. And this causes cardiovascular death and disability as well as psychological illness and emotional distress. And in among the patients who are hospitalized, you should know that pulmonary embolism is the most common prevalent cause of death. So you should correctly identify the uh, disease and you should correctly treat the disease so that the mortality rate will decrease. Not only acutely, the pulmonary embolism has got high mortality also, but in also chronic cases, it has got uh, more rate of disability. Like the patient will have, even after one year of suffering from pulmonary embolism, the patient will still have exercise limitation, decrease to walking distance, even shortness of breath, which, which all leads to the lowered quality of their life. And even the survivors of the DVT may uh, DVT and pulmonary embolism may have complications of uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension or post-thrombotic syndrome. So you should correctly identify and treat it. And now moving on to the pathophysiology of deep vein thrombosis. How does this occur? You, you people all know that about the Varcos triad and it consists of venous stasis, hypercoagulated state and endothelial injury, especially uh, if any uh, one of this occurs or especially when there is endothelial injury in the vessel, then that, lead, that leads to the recruitment of activated platelets and which leads to the release of microparticles that contain pro-inflammatory mediators. And the pro-inflammatory mediators goes and binds to neutrophils and this causes release of the nuclear material from the neutrophils which form the wave-like extracellular networks known as neutrophil extracellular traps. And what does these traps do? This network contains histone that is stimulate again more platelet aggregation and promote platelet-dependent thrombin generation. And the venous thrombi form and flourish in an environment. And when there is a formation of the venous thrombi, uh, the formation goes on increasing when there is especially venous stasis, low oxygen tension and upregulation of the pro-inflammatory genes. And why there is a... In normal people, the workers' triad is maintained. That is, there is no uh, hypercoagulable uh, hyper state. And this is all maintained uh, by the various physiology mechanism of our body. So in which patient does DVT occurs? In the patient who has got thrombotic state, like the patient who has got autosomal dominant genetic mutation, like a mutation in factor 5 latent and prothrombin gene mutation, or if the patient has deficiencies of coagulation factors, inhibitors like uh, antithrombin protein CS, CNS, or the, if the patient has got antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, or even if the patient has sedentary lifestyle, this increases the risk of fetal pulmonary embolism. And even the, in the patient who have inflammation, chronic inflammation, Inflammation such as a uh, patient who has who is suffering from psoriasis and inflammatory bowel disease, they have uh, they have the high risk of venous thromboembolism. And the other causes uh, that leads to uh, Varcos triad includes uh, cancer, obesity, cigarette smoking, uh, systemic arterial hypertension, chronic disease such as uh, more chronic disease such as COPD, CKD, blood transfusion. Even when the patient travel uh, to has a long uh, year travel, they have got history of immobilizations, which leads to the venous stasis, leading to the uh, venous thromboembolism. Even the person who, have, who are on uh, OCPs or who are pregnant or who are on postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy, they have high, high risk of uh, venous thromboembolism. Even we should consider a patient uh, with high risk of thromboembolism who, are, who have just undergone surgery and who are on immobilization state. Now, uh, due to all this, when the patient has got uh, thrombosis or uh, thrombi formation in the deep vein, then what happens to that? Usually, uh, when uh, the deep uh, vein goes away, detached from their site and uh, from the site of formation and go to, goes away uh, in far distant sites. And that is known as embolization. And where usually it goes? It usually embolizes to the vena cava, right atrium, right ventricle, and even loss into the pulmonary artery circulation, which is which uh, causes pulmonary acute pulmonary embolism.
generally uh, the venous uh, all the thrombi that forms in the venous goes into the venous circulation not in the arterial circulation only the pulmonary they goes only into the pulmonary artery however if a patient has a defect in uh, atrial septa also known as the patent foramen ovale then the patient also can have the thrombi from the venous uh, uh, venous sources can go into the at arterial sources and the many patient when uh, during the presentation when you finally diagnose a patient with pulmonary embolism they may not have the evidence of deep vein thrombosis because the clot that was formed in the uh, deep vein of the leg may have already embolized to the lungs and there are various non thrombotic causes that causes pulmonary embolism like in cases of the pelvic or long bone fracture there can be a case of fat emboli embolism that means uh, there is a fracture of long bone and the fat from the uh, bone marrow and from the bone that goes and displaces and goes and uh, goes up to the pulmonary artery causing the pulmonary embolism and there are other embolism also like in case of uh, cement embolism and bony frag fragment embolism in case of patient who had undergone total hip or knee replacement even in cases people who are iv drug abusers uh, from the syringe they uh, from in the vein they may inject here talcum powder or even cotton and this may causes the thrombotic upon non thrombotic pulmonary embolism and in cases of the uh, pregnant female uh, the amniotic fluid embolism may occur when fetal members leak or tear at the placental margin and what happens when there is uh, pulmonary embolism the emboli goes and uh, go the emboli goes up to the pulmonary artery this all causes the increase in anatomical death space and this is due to because uh, breath gas does not enter gas exchange unit of the lung and this also leads to increased physiological death space because ventilation to gas exchange unit exit uh, venous blood flow through the pulmonary capillaries and this all leads to atrial hypoxemia and increased alveolar arterial oxygen tension gradient and which represents the inefficiency of O2 transfer across the lungs and this leads to the hypoxemia and the patient usually presents with shortness of breath and this all causes what happens the thrombi goes and uh, stuck into get stuck into the artery pulmonary artery and this leads to uh, the thrombi itself and even the uh, release uh, the there are various substance um, substance release of a substance like serotonin from the uh, platelet that platelet that causes the increase pulmonary vascular resistance and due to the hypoxia there will be alveolar hypo hyperventilation and uh, due to the constriction of the uh, terminal bronchi bronchi it leads to the increased airway resistance and which all leads to decreased pulmonary compliance and finally there will be a pulmonary hypertension and when there will be the pulmonary hypertension what does it causes it causes the uh, tension in the right ventricle which leads to the enlargement of the right ventricles and which causes the dysfunction of the right ventricle what happens when the right ventricles enlarge it causes two things first it uh, gives pressure to the atrial wall, uh, ventricular wall and uh, this leads to the narrowing of the left ventricle so that when there will be diastole there will be no proper fill filling of the left ventricle and this leads to the decrease uh, cardiac output one thing and next thing that happens when there is right ventricular enlargement is due to dysfunction is that there will be the decreased coronary flow which leads coronary artery flow which leads to the right ventricular microinfarction and as uh, due to as the patient doesn't would not have the decrease uh, left ventricular filling and uh, decrease cardiac output this all leads to circulatory collapse and death and this all occur so sudden if the patient has uh, developed acutely develop pulmonary embolism and the patient will acutely develop uh, shortness of breath and this all will be so shortened that uh, it really takes uh, it really takes much time so it is uh, very useful that you people should uh, promptly uh, suspect a patient if a patient has got pulmonary embolism and you should all uh, uh, do the investigation and you should start the treatment and now moving on to the classification uh, deep vein thrombosis has been classified into three uh, three categories that is lower extremity deep vein thrombosis upper extremity deep vein thrombosis and superficial venous thrombosis usually the most common is the lower extremity uh, extremity thrombosis a dvt that is it's around 10% more common than the upper extremity dvt and uh, lower extremity dvt usually begins in the calf and propagates to the 
colitial vein, femoral vein, and iliac vein. And the upper extremity DVT, uh, though usually rarely occurs, but it is precipitated by placement of the pacemakers, internal uh, cardiac, cardiac defibrillator, or indwelling uh, central venous catheter. And uh, pulmonary embolism is uh, classified as massive pulmonary embolism, submassive pulmonary embolism, and low risk pulmonary embolism. Now moving on to the clinical features. Uh, as I have told, already told you, most common symptom for the pulmonary embolism is unexplained breathlessness, especially in the patient who are hospitalized or on the patient who are uh, who have been through the prolonged immobilization. However, the signs and symptoms are very non-specific non and the patient even may present with a syncope or hypotension or sinuses. And for DVT, uh, the most common clinical feature is the uh, cramp or the pain in the lower calf that possesses are in intensified over several days. Even the patient may present with the leg edema. And in case of massive pulmonary embolism, patient may even present with a cardiogenic uh, shock, as I told you, because there is decreased, car decreased cardiac output and the patient can die from the multi-system organ failure. Now, moving on to the differential diagnosis. If a patient presents to you with a uh, soiling of the unilateral soiling of the leg and pain in the leg, then you should also think the patient may have ruptured bigger uh, cyst or muscle strain or injury, cellulitis or acute prosthrombotic syndrome or venous insufficiency. And for pulmonary embolism, the differential diagnosis includes a pneumonia, any cause of the any uh, respiratory other causes like pneumonia, asthma, COPD, exacerbation, or it could be due to the uh, myocardial infarction or due to the congestive. Uh, uh, leading to congestive heart failure or it could be due to the pericarditis or to be due, if there is trauma, trauma it could be due to refracture or it could be due to pneumothorax or even sometimes the patient can have shortness of breath and chest pain up even after the anxiety now how do you make the diagnosis okay history uh, again the history taking is of uh, utmost important and you should do uh, one calculate one score that is wells moit score and this criteria helps you to estimate st estimate the clinical likelihood of patient having dvt and p if a, you suspect a patient has DVT or PE, then you must calculate the wells moit score. And if the uh, score shows that the patient has low to moderate likelihood of DVT or PE, then you should uh, do the if, undergo the initial diagnostic evaluation with D-dimer testing alone without any imaging test. But if the patient has got high clinical likelihood, likelihood of uh, DBT or PE, then you should skip the D-dimer test because it will take, it is a blood test. And if you order a blood test and it will come and after that you will decide about the imaging, uh, it, it could be of, um, it, the patient may have got delay, delay for the start of the treatment. So you should uh, directly go to the imaging process as a next step in the diagnostic algorithm. Now, looking at the Wells score, uh, it has uh, got various component. You should have the, there are various, uh, uh, variables and you should ask if the patient ha and you should look at the ask the history and you should uh, calculate the score. Uh, if the patient uh, patient should is uh, suggestive of uh, having the low likelihood clinical likelihood of DVT and uh, DVT if the point score is zero or less and the patient is said to have the moderate likelihood to score if the score is one to two and high likelihood if the score is three or greater. Uh, you should always calculate uh, the Wells score so that uh, it will give you the idea about how to proceed to the patient, how to do the diagnosis to the patient. And it consists of the some of the points like if the patient has cancer, of the if the patient is bedridden for more than three days, of the if the patient has a leg swelling, or if the patient has pitting edema. Also, it will look for the clinical uh, signs like heart rate, or if the patient has got hemoptysis. And now this uh, chart shows the overall alg algorithm for the diagnostic uh, imaging, like to whom to whom you will go for the imaging, uh, imaging or to whom you will only do the blood test or to whom you will not uh, do much of the things. It is all guided by the Wells score. Uh, for DVT, you look at the Wells score and the score is uh, low than what you will do. The next thing that you will do is you will order for the blood test. That is, you will look for the D-dimer. If the patient has no normal D-dimer label, then you will not, uh, so the patient doesn't have DVT and you will look for the other causes of the leg swelling. And But if the patient has high D-dimer, then you will do the imaging, further imaging test uh, so that you will confirm the diagnosis. And if the patient has uh, got uh, a Wells score is not low, then you should directly go for the imaging test. 
And for the patient of, if you suspect a patient had pulmonary embolism uh, and you'll calculate the well score and the well score is not very high, again, you'll look for the D-dimer. If it is normal, then it's not pulmonary embolism. You should uh, think, look out the other different, work for the other differential diagnosis. And if the D-dimer level is high, then you should look for the imaging test. And now, uh, what are uh, what are the tests uh, that after you uh, calculate the well score, uh, then what are the tests you are going to do? It is divided into non-imaging uh, modalities and imaging imaging modality. And in non-imaging modality, there are uh, some blood tests and uh, other tests. And in blood test, the first thing you look for is the D-dimer test, and uh, it. In D-dimer is usually the product of the breakdown of fibrin by plasmin and uh, the sensitivity of D-dimer is more than 80% for TBT and it is more than 95% uh, for pulmonary embolism. And other biomarkers that you can even look for is in case of pulmonary embolism, as I've already told you, it may cause right ventricular uh, micro uh, micro abscess and micro so you, there will be uh, elevated cardiac biomarkers like uh, serum troponin and even you can look for plasma heart type fatty acid binding uh, protein levels uh, it all will be raised due to right ventricular microinfarction and uh, sometime uh, due to the uh, enlarged site uh, enlarged size of the right ventricle this may lead to the uh, release of the brain natriuretic peptide or antipro brain natriuretic peptide even you can measure the level of this enzymes and all other uh, non-imaging uh, modality of diagnosis include uh, by doing the uh, electrocardiogram uh, and ECG and uh, in this uh, the most uh, frequently cited abnormality is tachycyte sinus tachycardia and the other abnormality that you can uh, see is an S wave in the lead one or Q wave in lead three and inverted T wave in lead three and even you can even because there is a right ventricular enlargement and dilatation and dysfunction, you can even see right ventricular stain pattern and ischemia. And that is uh, shown by T wave inversion and lead to B1 to B2, B4. And the other modality uh, that uh, non-invasive imaging modality includes uh, venous ultrasonography. If you suspect a patient with a DVT, you can ask for the patient uh, to get a venous ultrasonography. And uh, it uh, relies on the loss of vein compressibility as the primary diagnostic criterion. And even you can order the Doppler imaging to look for the venous flow dynamics. And the next uh, modality, uh, which can be of least helpful, but again, you can even order because it's very commonly available is chest X-ray. In chest X-ray, usually it may be a normal. Uh, however, in some cases of massive uh, pulmonary embolism, you can find a focal oligemia that is also known as western mark signs or a peripheral waist shape density usually located at the pleural base, also known as Hampton thumb home, or an enlarged right descending pulmonary artery, also known as Pala sign. It is due to the increase pulmonary artery pressure and the most the principal imaging test uh, that will lead to the diagnosis of the pulmonary embolism is the chest uh, computer tomography and in this uh, one first thing it uh, gives a detail about the uh, if there is any uh, embolism in the pulmonary artery or not and also it also gives the excellent uh, four chamber view of the heart uh, so that you can see if there is a, how is the right ventricles and how is the left uh, ventricle and even you can if you could do the CT scan of uh, uh, CT scan imaging of uh, the chest to the knee then knee and pelvis and you can even diagnose uh, the proximal uh, leg DVT by the CT scan and in cases in patient who doesn't have PE also you can find out if there is any other long parenchymal diseases like pneumonia, emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis and even some cases uh, by chest CT scan you can find out the asymptomatic early stage lung cancer. And the next modality of uh, diagnosis can be by the by doing the long scanning and this is usually the second line of uh, diagnostic test for pulmonary embolism and it's usually uh, used for the patient who can't tolerate uh, intravenous uh, contrast and and the perfusion scan usually detect uh, in defect indicates the absence or decreased blood flow possibly due to pulmonary embolism this is not the first line of uh, investigation that you are you people are going to do
And the other uh, imaging modality include uh, magnetic resonant uh, imaging MRI. But however, MRI is less sensitive, sensitive and you can only uh, look at the very large uh, pulmonary embolism. Uh, it could miss out the small segmental and subsegmental pulmonary embolism. So this is not a good uh, choice of investigation. Uh, you can also look for echocardiogram uh, and in echocardiogram uh, in cases of massive P you can uh, see of the see for the right ventricle or even you can see the left ventricle and the ejection fraction you can find out the contraction or you can find out if there are there are other causes of chest pain other than pulmonary embolism that will be ha very helpful and there is one sign known as McConnell signs uh, present in cases of patient with uh, pulmonary embolism and that is hypokinesis of the right ventricular few while with normal or hypokinetic motion of the right ventricular of epics. Now moving on to invasive diagnostic test. Uh, the invasive diagnostic test is pulmonary uh, angiography that we usually do and in the figure that is you can see there is a, a black arrow that points to the the black arrow uh, that points to the hypertense area and this is the saddle embolism in the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery. However, uh, nowadays uh, CT with contrast has uh, replaced uh, this test uh, because this is an invasive test and, and it is usually reserved for the patient uh, with with uh, who has got technically unsatisfactory CT chest and for those in whom an intervention procedure such as catheter directed thrombolysis is planned. That is uh, usually if you do a patient with a contrast uh, uh, CT, then you can find out if the patient has PE or not. Uh, but again, uh, previously and the most commonly used test is pulmonary angiography. Uh, now, after you uh, you do uh, you find a patient has a uh, patient was uh, admitted to the hospital. The patient got uh, acutely onset shortness of breath, and you uh, look at the patient. Patient became hemodynamically unstable, and you look uh, ask for the dimer test, and you went for the imaging. You do imaging test that is contrast CT, and you found out that the patient has pulmonary embolism, or you do uh, a patient has got a uh, wind uh, swelling and leg swelling in lateral leg swelling and the patient has got pain and you do a you run a venous uh, ultrasound of the leg and you found out the dvt now what to do now next now we are going on to the treatment and for the treatment of uh, deep pain thrombosis uh, for, for the primary uh, that you should know that the treatment go, you we have got to do two modality of treatment first primary treatment and then the secondary treatment so that the patient won't have got the recurrent symptoms and for the primary therapy it usually consists of clot dissolution with pharmaco with pharmacomechanical therapy that usually in the, uh, includes low dose catheter directed thrombolysis and for this we have got a uh, use of the anticoagulation and there are two two types of anticoagulation non warfarin based anticoagulation and warfarin anticoagulation for non warfarin anticoagulation the drugs that we use is unfractionated heparin enoxaparin del, uh, deltaparinox or tinzaparin or fondaparinox and for warfarin uh, anticoagulation we usually use warfarin and for secondary prevention of uh, secondary prevention also we use the uh, anticoagulation or we, we do go for the placement of a, of an in, inferior benecable filter and now for the pulmonary embolism treatment for this again uh, the, you you have to categorize the patient if the patient has got a uh, sub uh, massive p or sub massive p because uh, according to the categorization there will be a different uh, treatment modality first uh, uh, you look for the patient if the you uh, look for you suspect a patient with p you do the uh, investigation and you found out the patient has pulmonary embolism now what you do is you see if the patient has a uh, uh, maintain uh, blood pressure or not if the patient has normal blood pressure plus normal right ventricle uh, then you'll go for the secondary prevention only that is you'll directly start the patient on anticoagulation uh, therapy alone or you will start on the inferior benecable filter you will ask the patient to get a inferior benecable filter but you ask the patient uh, you look at the patient and the patient has normal tension plus uh, right ventricle hypokinesia uh, then you should uh, look uh, think like what you are going to do either you will start on the anticoagulation alone or you'll go for the inferior venicava venicava uh, filter and if the patient has is hemodynamically unstable the patient has pe and the patient has got hemodynamic instability that is the patient is tachypnea saturation is falling or the pressure uh, the blood pressure is not maintained the patient has undergone uh, now into eye drop support then you should always 
always uh, do the very uh, act fast and you should start the patient on the thrombol uh, anticoagulation plus you should go for thrombolysis or even you can go for the uh, surgical treatment like embolectomy. And like uh, for how long uh, do you need to treat a patient with uh, DVT or pulmonary embolism? Uh, you should know that if the patient has got provoked uh, DVT, that is a patient has uh, got uh, DVT, developed DVT after uh, or some, some certain surgery or after using OCP or after pregnancy or in pregnancy, then you should know that uh, you should give the treatment, treatment for at least three to six months. And the patient who has got, uh, if the patient has got uh, DVT or P uh, and the patient has got cancer, you should at least uh, treat the patient until and unless the patient is cancer free. And in cases of patient who has got EDO uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis or uh, pulmonary embolism, you should give the patient the treatment for lifelong. And for the patient who, to whom you will start on warfarin, you should uh, look for the PT INR every, uh, every 21 days and you should maintain the target INR between 2 and 3. And and now moving on to the anticoagulation. Uh, what are the methods of anticoagulation? There are typically three methods. And the first is the classic one uh, in which uh, you will firstly start the patient with a parental anticoagulation like with unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinox uh, with uh, breathing to the warfarin. First, you will uh, start the patient with parental therapy for four or five days in hospital stay and with the warfarin and you will start the patient with uh, warfarin and obviously uh, you will ask the patient to come follow up in every three weeks to look for the uh, PTINR and you will maintain the INR between two and three. And the next, uh, and this uh, for this is the conventional old method. And in this, you have to ask the patient to uh, do the follow up for every uh, three weeks, and you should look for the uh, look for the test, uh, various blood tests. But uh, other two methods have also uh, came and now is effective. Like uh, you can even give the patient to parental therapy, and you could uh, switch. Uh, initially parental therapy in the hospital stay and you can switch uh, to novel oral anticoagulants such as dabigatron or idoxaban Idoxaban, or you can directly even uh, start the patient with oral anticoagulation monotherapy with uh, like rivaroxaban or apixaban. In, in, in this, you have to start the patient in low dose and uh, following after uh, two, three weeks or one week, uh, you will uh, start on the maintenance dose without parental anticoagulation. And these are all individualization should be done to whom to give, to whom to which therapy is to be given. And for uh, inferior vena cava filter, uh, to whom patient to whom to start on anticoagulant therapy and to whom you have to ask for the inferior vena cava filter. In the patient who has got recurrent venous thrombosis, despite intensive anticoagulation, or if there is any active bleeding that precludes, uh, and you can even don't give, you can give, give the patient with anticoagulation, you should ask the patient to insert a IVC filter. However, I, uh, it has got uh, various uh, complications like recurrent DVT or cable thrombosis with marked leg swelling. So this is not given to every patient, only to the few selected patient who has got a history of recurrent uh, venous thrombosis despite of the anticoagulant or who have got a contraindication to anticoagulant. You should ask the such patient to, uh, patient to undergo surgery to uh, surgery for inferior cava filter. And as I told you, for the patient who has got massive pulmonary embolism, who has got the who are hemodynamically unstable, you should probably uh, go for fibrinolysis. And fibrinolysis uh, uh, the reserve, uh, res reverses the right heart failure and, and even it causes, uh, it results in the lower rate of the death. And it uh, decreases uh, the rate of the death and the recurrent uh, pulmonary embolism by dissolving much of the anatomically obstructing pulmonary arterial thrombus and by preventing the continued release of serotonin and other neurohormonal factors, and even by uh, lysing much of the sources of the thrombus in the pelvis or deep leg veins, thereby, thereby uh, decreasing the likelihood, likelihood of recurrent uh, pulmonary embolism. And the substance that is used for fibrinolysis is recombinant tissue plasminogen activator. And now moving on to pharmacomechanical uh, catheter director therapy. Uh, it's usually, it usually combines physical fragmentation or pulverization of the thrombus with uh, catheter director low dose thrombosis. And uh, there is uh, use of various uh, mechanical techniques and the 
uh, it's used in the patient who has got relative contraindication to full dose of the thrombolysis. And the other method include pulmonary embolectomy. You can even ask, uh, these, are, these were all the medical therapy or you can even go for the surgical therapy. But uh, the, since I told you, it has got a high risk of mortality, high mortality, early treatment and early uh, diagnosis and early treatment is of utmost importance. So uh, if uh, there is availability of the good surgery and uh, good surgeon, everything, even the patient can go to pulmonary embolectomy as it has got uh, low risk of uh, hemorrhages, uh, as there is high risk of is with the uh, fibrinolysis therapy and anticoagulant therapy. And the next method, uh, treatment method is pulmonary thrombo in arterectomy. And this is uh, done for the patient who has got dyspnea due to the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Like a patient developed a pulmonary embolism and after uh, acutely treated, but in long term, the patient developed complication of pulmonary hypertension, then in such patient, you should ask for pulmonary thrombo in arterectomy. And now what to do the patient in the patient, if a patient is pregnant uh, and the patient developed DVT, now what to do, uh, what to do, you should start, you can give the, uh, give uh, oral anticoagulant, that is what is contraindicated as it is teratogenic. So uh, usually the pregnant female who has got DVT or PE, we start on low molecular weight heparin. And now what to do? This was all for the treatment. Now, uh, as you know that the, the uh, pulmonary embolism is the most uh, common cause of uh, acute uh, onset shortness of breath in hospitalized patient. So there are some uh, factors that you can do, some uh, management you can do for the patient so that there will be, there will be no P in the patient who are admitted in the hospital. Uh, for prevention of the uh, venous thromboembolism, uh, you should ask uh, the patient who are all admitted, you should ask for the patient to start on anticoagulant during the period of the hospital hospital stay and to the patient who has got uh, who are high risk uh, non orthopedic surgery or who are cancer patient who are uh, who are cancer all that you should start on the patient on the either on unfractionated heparin or you should give enoxaparin or del uh, deltiparinox accordingly which is which all is available and the patient who are, who are undergoing major orthopedic surgery you should start the patient on warfarin with target INR of 2 and 3 this is all for today. Thank you.